Hello, everybody, stargazers and astro freaks, and happy three-year anniversary, gentlemen. We are starting our fourth year this very morning. Uh, once a week online live vlog for Santa Barbara, California's Longtime Telescope and Astronomy Club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, heard and seen at 11 a.m. for an hour. We're just talking about some people that listen to us. That makes us a podcast in that disrespect. We call it the SBAU Astro Hour, and it's not shaking up the universe on YouTube, but you can watch us, and we're having fun, not going anywhere. I'm your host, Ron Heron, Vice President of the club for a few years. I'll introduce you to the rest of the board, some of the other members, and passionate people, let me tell you, with telescopes. Meanwhile, follow us on YouTube. You can ask questions, comment, because I got to tell you, folks, these are some of the brightest, most knowledgeable folks I know. Come join our club. We meet up at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, usually on the first Friday of every month at 7 o'clock. It'll be um, the second Friday in April on the 12th inside. I guess it's called the uh, Art Gallery Courtyard. Court, courtyard so, Gallery, yeah. That's right. And I got Dr. Carey come to talk about uh, extraterrestrial life, looking for it. And uh, incidentally, there's a free planetarium show if you get there at 7 before the party begins inside. And that's at 7.30, our meeting only takes about 10 minutes. Uh, we're also, uh, let's see, Saturday, that's the second Saturday. That's coming up this coming weekend in March. We have our big star party. <clears throat> and right now, let's talk about where we're going to be kicking around today on our fourth year. This is uh, episode number 159. There's a recurring Nova out there in the Corona Borealis, and it's high time it stopped. We're crying out loud. This is getting <laughs> crazy. Comet 12P, Pons Brooks, closing in on the sun. We're going to talk about it. You can see it. You can see it. How about Asteroid 4 Vesta? Where is it and what's it doing? It Doing a lot of asteroid stuff this week. Interesting view of Saturn's rings. Andromeda gets a close-up. That's supposedly all the stars in the Andromeda galaxy are pictured in this Hubble photo. They don't have enough pixels. There's a trillion stars in our nearby galaxy. And something fell into the Pacific off of New Guinea, just north of Australia, a deep space, I guess, um, asteroid or not asteroid, but a meteor that they're going to try to dig up or get out of the ocean. Well, that was a long time ago. And, and they did. Well, anyway, we'll talk about it. We'll get to I'll, that, yeah. I'll let you talk, Chuck. No, that's. Well, look, we'll, we'll is, hit it. The yeah. president is on my screen above you. He was there Friday night for Bob Berman's talk. Jerry Wilson, good morning. Good morning. On this, uh, what is today's date? The 4th? 4th, March 4th. March in the year of our whatever. And Chuck McPartland is below him in front of the, yeah, the flag of Ukraine. He's our incredible outreach coordinator. Uh, was our uh, secretary or half of the secretarial duet with his wife, Pat, who is our merchandise manager and our new treasurer, and nobody's better. Tom Whittemore is with us. Morning. He used to uh, teach, I guess, a, a science lab out at Westmont College. He's married to Maureen, and he's editor of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit's monthly newsletter. Jerry's married to Pat Forge, incidentally. I want to get the wives in here. Bruce Murdoch joins us, longtime supporter and telescope enthusiast. Wave at us, Bruce, so they know oh, who you are. That, there, there we are. are. And he's also president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society that I do hope survives the impending Chapter 11 bankruptcy of Metropolitan Theaters. <laughs> Maybe you heard well, that. The organ is not owned by Metropolitan. It's owned by the Santa Barbara Heritage Foundation. I heard it was owned by the Corwin family, which may be the Heritage family. It's going to be interesting. It's not going to go anywhere. And there's Tim Crawford. Uh, Bruce is married to Bonnie. No, wait a minute. Yeah, Bruce yeah. is married to Bonnie. Tim's married to Karen. And we thank Karen for getting him on board so we could see the top of his ball. <laughs> I forgot. Friday night. <laughs> We're an incredible talk from the day room there, the little a lounge or operating office, I guess, of Bob Berman, who just retired as the, uh, I guess, columnist in Astronomy Magazine this year. But he's still on the pages of Discover, Science Magazine, and the Old Farmer's Almanac. Mm -hmm. Jerry, you sent us a handful of incredible silly science cartoons. You forward those to all the guys. We get a good kick out of them. We want to share them with you every week on the Astro Hour. <laughs> oh, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, we only have four this week. This is you know, great. 
<laughs> I, I'm glad this one clarified. Uh, stop sign uh, at an intersection in hell. No left, no right, no forward, no back. Everything is the wrong way. Reminds me of a cartoon I once saw depicting a man sitting there at a stop sign in his open convertible. He'd turned into a rotting corpse covered with spider webs. <laughs> <laughs> well, the sign never said go. It still says stop. There's it's a similar joke. Where yeah. uh, a somebody a skeleton was found inside a shower with the shower still running, <laughs> and uh, everybody was kind of wondering what the cause of death was. You know, it would seem to be starvation, but the question was, you know, why? And then the detective came and he picked up the bottle of shampoo and he said, "Ah, I know the answer. This was a computer programmer, and the side of the bottle says lather, rinse, repeat." <laughs> <laughs> Infinite loop, huh? Which yeah. we did. <laughs> okay, let's get to some of the other sillies here. I have a little <laughs> levity at the start. Of, oh, this one I loved. Crunch, yes. one of the Apollo guys, the astronaut, <laughs> is descending, <laughs> descending the limb ladder on the side of the leg, waiting for him on the this. moon's surface is, uh, let's say, a bit of a smashing surprise. Guess what? Oh, no, he smashed into the eggs. Mm -hmm. He right. broke the egg. Yeah. And the is there. right there. Wasn't that the plot of Alien? <laughs> Somewhat uh, sort of the egg was more aggressive in alien. That's true. Yeah. That's right. The egg would have got him in that case. <laughs> okay, this one I like. Aliens and a UFO are sucking up a uh, terrible grizzly bear. Gonna soon learn the ugly truth about grizzlies, unless of course that's Smokey stripped of his park ranger outfit. So <laughs> yeah. Soon learn the certain furry earthlings get a little grumpy when they're probed. <laughs> you'd think we'd have the remains of that those guys that crew they were taking right. off right over roswell when it had happened of course that's <laughs> right <laughs> now this is this was titled schrodinger's gate yeah <laughs> this is before the uh wave function collapsed yeah <laughs> well, how can you disagree with that sign it's either going to be open or shut sure yeah, right. should it be must it be okay <laughs> Man's ignorance is unlimited sometimes. There you go. Well, we got some fascinating topics to kick off the new season, gentlemen. Year number four. Jerry, what's on your mind? Uh, you want to go out um, to Corona yeah, Boy, Alice? Working on... He's trying to call something up. Jerry's in control. He is our Captain Kirk of the starship. <laughs> Beam me back up, uh, Dr. Spock, Mr. Spock. Okay, you're going to want to enlarge that, maybe. Okay, yeah. Oops. We love the night sky. Uh-oh. There's that 2001... <laughs> What's it called? Oh, the again? monolith? The monolith again, yeah. Here we go. Is it the monolith there? It, no, it's gone. It's no, 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 we're it's fine. It's gone. Good. This is uh, Corona Borealis uh, T, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, T. Yeah. And it's a recurring nebula in the constellation Corona Borealis. It's fairly easy to find for us star hoppers. Re just recurring think... Nova, just to uh, interject. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What did I say? Nebula. Nebula. <laughs> yeah. I miss it fairly really often. So why, it's an easy... why does it share a word with Aurora Borealis? It, it, it's in the constellation. Yeah. It's in the oh, northern yeah. sky. Borealis means northern. Yeah. Okay, got Corona it. Borealis. Right. Northern crown. Yeah. All right. So this is, you just follow the arc of the constellation. This one is one of the few that actually looks like something. It looks like a crown. Mm -hmm. And you just go right off the end and bam, you're right there. Just before you get into serpents, the snake um, is this star. And this star is a recurring nova. Mm -hmm. Now, a recurring nova is a um, it's a pair of stars with a small white dwarf, which ended up there by throwing off its ended up being a white dwarf by throwing off its outer layers. But it's got a companion that it's close enough to that it's gravitationally sucking off hydrogen from the big guy. And it's landing on the white dwarf. And eventually, as it lands, it compresses on the surface because the white dwarf has a fierce gravity, not as much as a neutron star, but it compacts the hydrogen. And as the hydrogen 
gets uh, more and more massive, it eventually heats itself up through compaction until it reaches the point where it can fuse. And so then the hydrogen all of a sudden and explosively uh, has a super hydrogen bomb effect. And that is the Nova. And then it blows the stuff off and then it starts accumulating uh, more stuff from the big guy again. And so the last time this one happened was in 1946. Mm -hmm. My birth year. <laughs> I was five years old then. I, I was two years old. <laughs> I was minus three. <laughs> okay. You were still a gleam in your dad's eye. Yeah. <laughs> so which yeah. of the two has more matter compacted, the white dwarf? No, well, I don't know which is the, the um, they're at different stages of their life. The, one is a red giant star and oh. one is a white dwarf. The white dwarf is very compact, but I think the red giant is probably has more matter. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know what? Not to interrupt, but John Martinez is on board uh, in the uh, chat area. He said, hello, everyone. John Martinez here calling from New Orleans. Wow. Okay. Mr. LTO, my yeah. Yeah. So there's John. Yeah. Hi, John. Yeah. Well, John, say something about our topic and write it on the screen. Yeah. Hey, Ron, <laughs> just yeah. to get you a feeling for that scale there. Look at that. So that thing went basically from, you can't see it with your eye, about 10th magnitude, need right. a six or an eight inch scope to see it. Yep. And over the course of less than a week, it looks like, um, each of these little tick marks down there is a month. It went all the way up to third magnitude. Very easy to see. <clears throat> so if it goes off again this year, then they'll know its cycle. It'll be 78 years, right? It'll be, yeah, it'll, it'll it's a roughly 80 years. Okay. okay. And they're estimating... That's from modeling, not from observation. Mm -hmm. I don't think, do they have observations from earlier cycles? I'm not aware. They seem pretty confident that it's going to happen sometime in the next year. So maybe yeah. they have uh, right. data. Uh, Tom Totten says it will happen after midnight. Yeah. So. <laughs> of course, always. Yeah. But it's the little guy that loses the outer layer and loses more of its stuff. No, the little no. guy is gaining. Yeah. You have a small, very dense star, and then you have a big kind of fluffy star. Yeah. Oh, the dense which, one is which, sucking material off the fluffy one. Which one does the exploding? The, the, the dense one. one. The which? But it's only a layer on its surface. The white dwarf, the dense one. Oh, okay. So it's nothing like a nova or a kilonova or a supernova or any kind it's of nova. It's a nova. It is a nova. It's yeah. called a nova. It just means new star. They didn't know what was causing it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it does not the destroy same. the white dwarf. So this is a recurrent nova. It's a sudden spurt of fusion. Yeah. In, so in we could a probably, shell. If we could zero in on this this uh, binary, we'd see uh, sort of a shell that's exactly 77 light years away from the little guy, right? It depends oh, how it ejected it. Yeah. Okay. It, it's got very strong gravity. So I don't know how, how much gets ejected. It's 70 years, light years from us. It's They're not separated by 70 light years. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, the stuff doesn't travel at light speed. Yeah. Ah, okay. But as far as seeing, oh, I see. Right. Okay. Interesting. Now, this is, it's a variable star also. And this is a, its normal variability prior to the next eruption. This is from 2008 to 2010. Hmm. So what were their gaps? They just didn't look at it then? This was what? before um, uh, something interfered with the observation. This was before yeah. Las Cumbres Observatory ah, uh, kept okay. us in the dark. Well, also, for part of the year, it may be in the daytime sky. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, it, weather, bad weather, depending on where this was observed mm -hmm. from. Well, this is collection from the organization AAVSO. So it may not be from one site. Yeah. Right, right. I used to, as a teenager, used to observe for them. Uh-huh. I may even have the chart for uh, T. Corona Borealis. Okay. And at magnitude 10, have any of you seen this binary? And can you see them apart, or do they just show up as one? No, they're they're a single star to us. Single star. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of in the range of a six or an eight-inch telescope to see this, yes. just roughly. Okay, and when it goes, yeah, there'll be it'll be magnitude two, and we can see it with the naked eye. Yeah, it'll be up like Polaris. Like Polaris, wow! Mm -hmm. it's magnitude mm -hmm. two. Love this astronomy, man. Yep. 
Can I make a, just a, a real quick uh, uh, comment kind of update on this? Yes. You know, Ron, this is for you. The guy, John Martinez, that uh, like he he uh, he was a guy that he's speaking of people going out to Las Cumbres Observatory. He's the guy that used to work with them and set up all these telescopes all over the globe. That was John that did all that work. So uh, and, and did was, quite a bit of the work for setting up Palmer Observatory with the new scope. Well, yeah. he he mentioned that in the text. He was saying that he was, uh, you know, he was uh, remembering the time it, with on the Palmer Observatory project. But that's the guy that's listening in, and uh, he's a really, me, really neat guy. Tell him he sounds like a great future speaker. Get on board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd love really to hear. He did, you he did a presentation one time. He just signed <laughs> off, Ron. Oh, <laughs> story of my life. Okay. All now, right. We, we also have uh, a minor planet in view, um, the four Vesta, a nice four little planet. asteroid. Okay. Yeah. So this is during the month of March. Mm -hmm. Here we are right there at the fourth, fourth of March. Here's the Ides of March. <laughs> we get on into April and you can see it's covering a little more territory each night. So we're getting closer to it or it's getting closer to us. It's in a very nice field with uh, NGC 2174. I think that's the monkey head nebula. And then there's open clusters up here mm -hmm. uh, in Orion. The lines that put in the constellations aren't in this chart. Rather than make my own, I use this, even though it irritates Chuck. Yeah, it's, <laughs> the only way you have a hope of finding it using this chart is because M1 and Zeta, Orion, uh, Zeta Tauri happen to be in there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, real quick, the, do those dwarf planet asteroids like Vesta ever reverse course and retrograde like planets? Sure. Do yes. they do that? Okay. Everything outside of our, um, actually, even inside too, they all retrograde. But w would it be fair to say that it's sitting there in the middle of the belt and everything in that belt is going at, along, let's say, uh, in the same direction as Vesta is going right now, right? Not necessarily. They all have their individual orbit. Oh, really? As a group, they tend to be one way, but not. But there are exceptions. There are outliers, yeah. So okay. this is a better shot of the, that same thing with the constellation parts put in. The Crab Nebula is here. Um, M35 is up here. Mm -hmm. NGC 2158 is there and the nebula NGC 2174 is here. So Vesta is passing up through this part of the sky. Yeah. Hmm. Now on my computer, it's difficult to draw a curved line like Vesta and then label it. So <laughs> since NASA is going to these asteroids these days, any plans to visit Vesta or have we already? It's been visited, yeah. yeah. We, we went there. Did we orbit? Did we land? What did we do? Orbited. Just orbited, okay. Got some good pictures. <laughs> Now, this is um, the, uh, let me go back. I got a label that. This is NGC. 2129? Yes, I think so. 2158. Oh, no, that's that's an open cluster. Oh, is, oh that's right. These, yeah. uh, that's not right. You're right. Yeah, it's, it's not marked it's, on here. It's pretty dim, too. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it's this. Um, open cluster here. I see. Mm, yeah, it has to be. Well, no, not. It is 2127, 2129. Okay. Okay. This is M35 up here. Yeah. And this is the smaller one that didn't get an M number, which surprises me. Um, that is the um, 2158. Yes, yeah, that, that's pretty hard to see, Jerry. Yeah, that's a toughie. Yeah. yeah, it's way, way, way in the background. Yeah. Oh, it's got an NGC instead of an M. Yes, it's yes. the same yes. object. Got it. Mm -hmm. The M thirty five is a much bigger. It's huge. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is that it's twenty one fifty eight? Is that the one that's about eight times further away? Yeah, that's right, Tim. Yeah, yeah. and it's a, I I saw that one night at the uh, gun club. It's just fabulous. Yeah, and also the eight inch at uh, Westmont. It, it's it's a it's a really nice object. It's got a oh, nice yeah. little belt of brightness across the center too. <laughs> yeah, asterism. So all the NGCs were 
categorized, cataloged by Herschel, right? And his sister. Uh, and well, sister. they started it, but it was extended yeah. by who, yeah. Draper? Yeah, mm, okay. that's true. But, but unlike uh, Messier, all his numbers have four digits, right? He doesn't start with a one or a two, three, four. They get four sure. digits, right? Oh, there's sure. 100, 110 Messier objects. Right. Yeah. And 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 he started with one, two, three or whatever, you know, where they yeah. got those numbers. But as it got up into the seven and eight thousands or seven thousands, they uh, <laughs> they gave them all four digits. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. There are there are what about seven thousand NGCs? Yeah. 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 Between seven and eight thousand. Yeah. Okay. Holy cow. I didn't know that. Just over 100 <clears throat> M's. So this is the uh, this is the nebula. Wow. The nebula. Doesn't look too much like a monkey head now, but <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff up there. Vesta is just a little dot, mm -hmm. and uh, you have to look at it sequentially over several nights or at least several hours to see that it moves to identify I, it. I think this is the one that uh, Dick Beam, he's a member of the, our work, our telescope workshop, that he had a, a picture of this, and he's been doing fabulous uh, work with astrophotography. Yeah. There's a lot of new uh, programs out that uh, remove noise, um, sharpen the focus, remove stars or put them back in. Um, some of them based on AI and some of them based on deep learning. Mm -hmm. It's um, phenomenal how good they are, head and shoulders above previous software that did these jobs. Oh, just, just as an aside, um... Lee and Melissa at uh, Elwood School, they're, they're new outreach members. Uh -huh. They each got uh, the Sea Star 50s, the little uh, oh, automated yeah. small yeah. portable telescopes. Mm -hmm. And they set them up and they're fabulous for outreach. Uh -huh. um, they just set them up on a table and mm -hmm. they self-aligned and uh, they were showing the moon uh -huh. And they were showing the Orion Nebula. And after a few minutes of integration, the views were really good. They're small. It's, yeah. it's a small display. Um, and they wouldn't do very well with their focal length on planets. But for nebulae, they uh, and like for like the Andromeda galaxy, they're they're pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry, Jerry, you had something like that at Bacara last summer, huh? Yeah, I yeah. have one of those. I forgot what they are. EV scope. Yeah, yeah I neat. could never remember the name of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Unistellar. Unistellar EV. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it works very well. It's a little. I think they different. can talk to up to four phones in the neighborhood. Okay. So, so <laughs> for kids, Chuck, they those... could get a kick out of it and have it come onto their own cell phone. Yeah. Wow. Chuck, wow. do they? Do they? Oh, well, they will send it. The... They will send the Im image to people with their cell phones. That's the only way to view it. You, there's no eyepiece. So, yeah. but you, some you of them have, have like a it. small. They have a small screen built in, but you can also send it to a tablet or a cell phone. Right. right. Jerry, oh, Jerry okay. was displaying his, if I remember right, on a tablet. Right, Jerry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 And, and I'm not sure if the C stars do it, but but some of those will will broadcast up to four. Uh, nearby cell phones. Yeah, and and I think you can also get a module that you plug in from um, Celestron or or various companies that will make turn your telescope basically into a Wi-Fi hotspot, and you can broadcast whatever you're looking at if you. The telescope it. telescope becomes the Wi-Fi hotspot. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's really neat. That's the trouble with the trouble with that is that if you have if you broadcast to someone else, they also have control of the telescope. <laughs> can, I ask, can i ask a question gentlemen about the monkey head nebula yeah does it have an m number or an, or an ngc ngc okay and you can see it like this no this no. is a photograph almost none of what you see that is dramatic in a photograph can be seen by the eyeball in a telescope oh, These, okay. you see there's colors here right. and uh color vision is only triggered in our eyes with very bright lights. So you would never see color. I think this, the closest you get is that is the Great Nebula in Orion and it has a hint of red in it, as I recall, or green or something. So well, there's a lot of hydrogen around it that fluoresces. Yeah. But Do you no, think this is oxygen here, Jerry, in there, the bluish? That would be my guess. Yeah. Depends on what filter and what colors they assign to the image, that's, you know. That's right. <laughs> 
Okay. All the colors that you look at in photographs are false colors. They're all assigned. But stars are being born here. Stellar nursery, right? Yeah, I'm sure. Looks they like um, were, and I think that this one looks kind of thin and there's a cluster in it. I think this is in a later stage of star formation. So the stars are now blowing the dust away. So star mm -hmm. formation may have stopped. And it looks like there may be a denser part down there to the lower left that still exists yeah. that's getting yeah. eroded away. Yeah. You'd have to look in here and see if there's any globules or anything in here that are precursors to accretion disks. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow. Okay. Andromeda. Hans Brooks is still with us. It's in Andromeda, March 1. It's also speeding up as it approaches the sun. This comet will be in principle visible near the sun during the eclipse next month just a month and four days from now on april 8th if if you're in the zone of totality if you are in the zone of totality well it'll still be there yeah <laughs> you're not going to see it uh and you might not see it in the zone of totality because yeah. it has not reached visible at night it has not yet reached visible visible naked eye visibility so it certainly won't have it uh during an eclipse it's dark, but it's not dark night dark. But there are... Just, go ahead. Helion means it's coming into the sun, not going away. That's correct. Perihelion means it's closest point to the sun, yes. Okay, and there's a, is there another word meaning coming in versus going out? Pre-perihelion and post-perihelion. <laughs> and there's the famous Gazenta and Gazauta. Yeah. <laughs> but those are kind of technical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we won't get into the math. Right, okay. You can see it's speeding up as it comes in. So it's getting near Earth. It is speeding up as it goes near the sun, but when it visibly speeds up to us, it's getting near Earth, us. Is is there an average distance when the, these comets, there's so many comets, we know about them, so we must know which one came the closest to the sun, say within Mercury. Oh, yeah, there are sun, there yeah. are sun grazing comets that uh, satellites can see and sometimes they come so close to the sun, they skim the outer layers and the comet is completely destroyed. Yeah. But would they call it a comet if it came in and didn't cross our orbit? Just let pass. Yeah, it, if, it has a, if it has a tail, it's a comet. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Just a quick comment, Jerry, on the, uh, you know, the beta there, I believe is Miroc, right? Miroc, Chuck? Sounds in right. Yeah. Yeah, because 404 is right next 404, to 404, yeah. that, that, that is really neat. So that's a galaxy way in the distance. Uh, that's the ghost of Miroc. Yeah. That's the ghost of Miroc. Um, and every now and then we get a super night at Westmont. And, you know, we show it through the eight inch, you know, the, the pair of them. Now, the easy way for me to spot, um, find the nebula, the great nebula in Andromeda, mm -hmm. the one in Triangulum M33, mm -hmm. is that up here out of the, out of the top left field of view is Polaris. And you draw a line straightly, straight from Polaris to Miroc. It's a very noticeable star. Mm -hmm. And then you know you're halfway between these two galaxies. Right. Yeah, they and basically the split. They split. Yeah. yeah. Oh. This, this is because we're going to see it next month during the uh, eclipse. You know it's getting very close to the sun. Yeah. So if you want to see it at night, as this implies, <laughs> good um, luck. <laughs> you got it. You got to look quickly. You got to have a good horizon, and it's got to be dark. Yeah. Do you suppose that Mr. Pons and Mr. Brooks are working on this day and night, <laughs> sitting at the same telescope, working together? Just curious. This was years and years and years ago, Ron. That oh, they they're not even. It. It's not a new one. Okay. No. Generally, when our multi-named comets are from people that were that independently discovered it at, at roughly the same time. Ah. Uh, well, there's little chance I can get him to come speak to us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> might like be a one-sided comet, like Hale Bob, Ron. And and <laughs> and you know the media is really playing up this comet because it has periodic outbursts. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and it's the one that they've been calling the Green Devil Comet with horns. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, got a green tail. It's it's got a greenish <laughs> coma. They don't all have two tails, but some do, don't they? One going out from the sun, the other got going back where it came no, from. No, 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 no. It doesn't go towards the sun. It's when they have a fan-shaped tail. Apparently, it looks like it's pointed toward the sun. Okay. Because you see it on both sides of the of the coma. What is this? You could get an here? outburst on one side too, but usually it's the case that it's a fan-shaped tail. And this one has had some um, 
volcanic eruptions they that affect the tail. That's where you get the split tail effect. This is uh, this is a uh, uh, Hubble images of like the deep field long exposures, but this is of the Andromeda galaxy. This is the core of the Andromeda galaxy M thirty one, and this is out. Uh, about where the sun is in our galaxy, maybe a little farther for the sun. But um, this is blown up in this, is the next one. So you can see more structure here. There is, um, there are two, there's this two stars right there and right mm -hmm. there. And those are these two stars there and there. Mm -hmm. And then you zoom in again and you see the bright star and the little star. And that's these two down here. And at this level, you're starting to get good resolution on the background of the trillion stars there are in the Andromeda mm -hmm. galaxy. And Ron, I've got an asterism for you in the middle, the smiley face. You see the little smiley face? There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I see it. But now these two bright stars, are they in our galaxy or are they in Andromeda? Oh, no, Andromeda. They're that bright and- They're not, they're only bright by, by exposure. You see up here, these two stars are somewhere probably right there. Mm -hmm. So they're not a they're not a dominant star. This is uh, very far away. Hmm. Well now they couldn't point the web at this thing. Would it get too much heat? No, it, you could point the web at it. Oh you could you just can't point it at the sun. Right, so not the, our sun. So oh, these yeah. would be the Andromeda Alberio? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They they are blue and yellow. So, yeah, yeah. So, Although it looks like a tr it might be a triple. Um, oh, because of this one? No, no. Down the the one in the far in the corner looks like it might be double. There's a double set of diffraction oh, lights. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's elongated yeah. yeah. shaped. Yeah. <clears throat> that they, they can interpolate from this picture how many little dots to the number of an entire for the entire galaxy, right? A trillion. Yeah, it's a guess. Yeah. The, the technical term is to is a swag. Yeah, <laughs> is an acronym that stands for scientific wild ass guess. <laughs> That's pretty good. Oh, I like that. This I always is, thought that our galaxy had about four hundred billion stars, and Andromeda was a trillion. Yeah. Wow. Oh, Jeez. So this is a picture taken by um, Uwe Meiling, uh, amateur in. Germany, who is a Facebook friend, and he posts some of his stuff, which is very dramatic, mostly planets and the moon. Excellent picture of Saturn was taken on um, September 14. They do the eight dates backward on um, 2023. So if I can get away with saying this, we can see Saturn both from, for want of a better word, above and a below. This one was from below. It tips. Yeah, it it go it the 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 um the, the um, eclipse where, the ecliptic or the uh no no the the, the plane, plane of the rings plane <laughs> that's the Thank word you. we were looking right the plane of the rings does not line up with the ecliptic so we see it both top and bottom and we see edge on which is very dramatic. That's coming up in March of next year, where the rings actually disappear for a couple of hours. They're so yeah. thin. And this, this, is the, uh, this is the Zeiss 400 millimeter Cassegrain that Uwe takes his pictures with. And uh, this is him relaxing on his couch. <laughs> uh, this is a wide angle lens. It makes his observatory look like it's the Yerkes Observatory. It's massive, <laughs> but it's yeah. not really. It's But it's substantial. Um, it's by Zeiss Jena. Yeah. He probably pronounces his name Jerry Uwe. He's German. Uwe. Uwe? Yeah, Uwe. Okay. He's in an observatory? Yeah, he, he, this is yeah. his own backyard observatory. Actually, it's built on his house. Mm -hmm. It's what you should have built, Jerry, instead of that yeah. little square. And, and Ron? No, oh, the Ron, risk. Four, I was going to say, Ron, the 400 millimeter is basically a 16 inch. I mean, that's what we'd say. Yeah. What's yeah. what's the standard? So I'll know this tomorrow when I go out to LCO. Their worldwide scopes are what one meter or two meters? Yeah. They have a couple of one meter scopes, and most of the rest are like sixteen inches. Sixteen inch, yeah. 
So one meter means they're over three feet across the mirror in the back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They used to get their glass from Russia, too, from from uh, ZWO, I think it is. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to hear what they're doing. I, I don't think they're making a whole lot of more scopes, but it'd be interesting to hear if they're having any problems with that. Do you know how big the mirror is in the back of a Hubble? It's 84 inches. inches. About eight feet. Yeah. yeah. 94 feet? inches. Oh, it's about it's two just, and a half meters in. Okay. Just short of the Hooker telescope on Mount Wilson, the 100. You, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Jerry, uh, uh, John mentioned, uh, I think this was about the Andromeda uh, image because of the delay. He was saying something. There's hints of Keeler's Gap. I don't know what that is. No, that Keeler's Gap. Keeler's Gap is in the um, asteroid belt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, what is this? This is Cassini's Gap? Cassini mm -hmm. Division and the Anka Division way out in the edge there. Yeah. 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 But the okay. Keeler Gap is, is in the uh, asteroid belt, and it's where you get a resonance with Jupiter and, and Mars, I guess, that causes them to get tossed out. Oh, okay. Okay. And you can see the crep ring, too, in that shot. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's right in here. Right there. Yeah. The C ring, the crepe ring. Yeah. Oh, that's the crepe ring. Real toughy. <laughs> Looks like crepe paper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That Oops, picture was the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> that picture of Saturn didn't come from Cassini, right? It came from Uve, from the guy in his observatory. Yeah. yeah he took <laughs> that in his backyard. Okay, now I understand what that means on your talking points. Oh, John says it's cut wrongly called the Enki Gap. Uh -huh. Did I did I misstate that? No, 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 it's just that he was adding on saying that it, it, he said it, the, uh, uh, the I don't know what exactly, I'm missing part of the, the text, but anyway, he said oh. uh, uh, both and then uh, 40, 40 seconds, and then it's wrongly called the Enki Gap. Maybe forty degrees. I'm not sure if that. Okay. That is. But anyway, you know, we we move on. Move on. Interstellar visitors. Now we have had a couple of stellar visitor, interstellar visitors. Um, Loeb at Harvard University is um, mm -hmm. claiming there's a non-zero possibility, but I think it's still very small. But <laughs> Oumuamua was a space probe from an alien agency. So, uh, and that doesn't mean uh, Central America. Yeah. So, um, and uh, prior to that, or, or since then, we've had Borisov, which is uh, another interlude or that came from interstellar space. But there was an earlier one called I Am One uh, from 2014 that is now um, acknowledged to be the first inter verifiable interstellar visitor. It was only realized about this that it was an interstellar visitor from data taken in 2014 by the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And the Air Force treated the information as secret because it would reveal the capabilities of their spy satellite and it was caught mm -hmm. on the spy satellite. But they have since done some analysis. They still won't release the, um, enough information for other people to calculate it. But their scientists went through and calculated that and verified that this is definitely on a hyperbolic trajectory and therefore came from interstellar space. Mm. And that little piece is Loeb and his buddies went out with, with magnets and stretched <laughs> the seafloor where they thought it might have landed or where the pieces right. might have come down. And they pulled up some little pieces like this. And he's saying they came from the meteor and other people who've analyzed it are saying, well, it, it, it looks more like industrial slag from air pollution. So <laughs> this is a tiny, that, tiny little piece. This is also a hotbed of activity in World War II. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of ships being sunk and a lot of ordnance being exploded. So um, for whether he found anything uh, uh, is a point that needs to be investigated. What, when did it come to Earth? 2014. 2014, it landed in the Pacific. Did it explode or whatever? It exploded in the was? upper atmosphere. September oh. 1st. Um, oh, no, it was. Oh, I've got the, the date. I don't know which way the date goes. It was either January 8th or September 1st. Good Lord. 2014. And this is the spot where it hit. And it was observed. Uh, um, 
by eyes. Wow. But uh, the um, the uh, orbit, oh no, this is going on to the next thing. Uh, so there is a project called um, the project, the Galileo project um, led by uh, Professor Loeb. And that is to try and recover specimens of the um, asteroid or the- So they think there's a bigger chunk down there? Uh, that's the speculation. The, but but that piece that, that was pictured was a piece that they brought up with their little trawler. Right. Um, but there's no scale on it. You know how big it is. Yeah, it's no. tiny. It's tiny. Yeah. It, it looks like it's on a piece of graph paper, centimeter, centimeter graph paper. Oh. Is it made of the same stuff that's in our solar system? You think all solar systems are pretty much the same, or do they think it'd be? That's what they're trying to find out. Right. So there is, and this parts like this that were discovered, um, um, they they got the Galileo project started, and it has been funded. Uh, the piece that they show there is, according to Loeb, it's a little older than dirt. Uh, <laughs> I'm the phrase there. You so, suppose you're still tracking a mua mua? Do I don't know. know. Probably. Possibly. Well, well, I know the path, so yeah. unless it unless it's doing some more strange maneuvers. <laughs> well, if it were if it were an extraterrestrial spaceship, it and it got here somehow, it would be smart enough to know that hey, there's a planet out there, the third one that's in the habitable zone. We might want to veer to the left and go visit them, but they didn't. I think that's a a moot point it blew up so no well well uh, ron's talking about Oumuamua. yeah oh Oumuamua. yeah okay I, well i think the chances of that while non-zero are incredibly low yeah. and borisov yeah. looks like a comet but it turned out to be a rock yeah that no, was a comet well oh, it's like a comet yeah it's, it has some volatile material coming off of it and it's it does uh, it changed its velocity well, that was Oumuamua. That was Oumuamua, but we had switched to talking about Borisov. Oh, okay. Because it looks like a comet. Yeah. It is. Okay, but we somehow because of its angle, uh, it, that we know it's extraterrestrial or... Because, because of, of its if orbit. Get, if you get three independent observations of the object, and not by three different people, but at three different times, you have enough coordinates to calculate the conic section for its orbit. And if it's a hyperbolic, that means it's open and, and it's not going to go out and turn around. It's just going to go come in from, from far away and go out and we'll never see it again. So it's interstellar. So it's interstellar. Wow. Now, <laughs> if you take the, the way this is labeled, one I am one, and if you put a hyphen between the M and the one, then it refers to the spacecraft that just landed and broke its leg <laughs> on landing and tipped over. So there's two I am ones out there. <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah. Can you imagine if that had happened to one of the Apollo landers? Oh, yeah. Oh. They'd still be there. Well, maybe well, not. They had, you know, they had a pilot on board that was actually looking out there and steering around the rocks before they put it down. Yeah. The, yeah. They were, they took control, manual control of Apollo 11 because they were, they feared they were landing in an, area of large boulders and so they wanted to move away from that just like bruce said but and you'd they were very careful to zero their lateral velocity too yes yes you'd think, you'd think the people in control of odysseus would have had some uh, way of turning that uh solar panel around in just oh. in case this happened you know so it won't go well, dead didn't expect it was going to happen yeah that that takes weight, and you lose you lose payload capability. You know if you start adding all kinds of extra stuff. So, so they just didn't plan on it falling over. But it well, did. their big problem was their own navigation system failed. Okay, they had a laser altimeter, and it failed. And so it turns out one of the packages that was on board by, from NASA had a laser. So they cobbled together using the NASA laser. They used signals from the NASA laser and fed it into their navigation system. And it didn't work exactly perfectly. And that's why they had problems. They right. came in at three times the speed they intended to come in and they had some lateral motion. So that's why they broke a leg and fell over. Yeah, the, the lateral motion was estimated in the article I read at two miles an hour. Yeah. Mm. 
And who's behind that lander? Is that uh, Be Jeff Bezos or uh, yeah. Elon Intuitive Musk? Machines? Well, yeah. Who were they? It's who a company. It was yeah, another startup. Some Texas outfit, Ron. Yeah. There are many, many private companies trying to get into the spacecraft game. Yeah. Um, so NASA just buys their units then? In some cases, yes. They they pitch a ride. Yeah. <laughs> and this Odysseus had a um had a CubeSat on board and they ejected it before landing. That was that was slim, I think. Oh, was it slim? Yeah. Okay. That's why they got a picture of Slim. <laughs> oh, when Slim was on its side. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Wow. Okay, well, now we're moving on to uh, another <laughs> thing. Well, the quarter hour. Apparently, you know. The Earth is has an asteroid that is co-orbiting the sun with us, and it is called, can anyone pronounce that? I don't do good on Hawaiian names. Like Kamo Lewa. Kamo Lewa. Kamo Lewa. You have to yeah. pronounce every letter. Like the island that's uh, off of uh, Kauai, uh, where the, you, you have to be a native to even visit there. Oh, that one, yeah. It's got two eyes in it N I I H A U. It's pronounced Niihau. You pronounce both eyes. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, on April 20, in April 2016, uh, we discovered a near-Earth asteroid named this, and um, it appears to be an outlier compositionally. It doesn't fit other types of uh, spectral data, does not fit the other common asteroids, but it does fit the spectral composition of the surface of the moon. And it is now believed to be a chunk of the moon that was knocked off the moon by... Um, an in impactor making a crater. Ooh. So older thrown up from the moon. And it is in a very low probability orbit. That is usually when impactors hit and make the debris fly up, it falls back on the moon or it completely escapes the moon earth system. This one had just the right dynamics apparently to orbit the sun and the earth so, well, somehow it almost duplicates our orbit. Almost, it does. Which, uh, can you go back? Which one is the uh, asteroid, and which one is us? The blue or the white? The blue uh, is us. The white is the asteroid. White is the asteroid. Okay, so we're all right. Yeah. Is it is it in our plane in the ecliptic plane? Mm, rough. Yes. Yeah. Rough. Yeah. This is Mer is the sun, Mercury, Venus. Earth, Mars. This is um, the orbit of the moon chunk. And it comes back. This is this is the orbit looking down on the whole thing. Right. But from the Earth, um, it looks like it's orbiting around here. Mm -hmm. That's why there's multiple um, loops in the model. Huh. So part of the time it's leading the Earth, it's up here in the orbit, and part of the time it's behind the Earth. Mm -hmm. So let me see if, and uh, no, that's another thing. Let me see if I can, there's a nice little video of that. Let's see if I can get that. Where did I put it? It's like it would have a year's orbit like we do, exactly. Roughly, yeah. Yeah, roughly it does. But it uh, corkscrews around us like the well, the moon doesn't do it that From way. From our perspective, it? we're it's moving and we're moving. We're both in in, in uh, elliptical orbits. Yeah, it depends which point of view you choose to be like your stable point. If you just look from the Earth, it appears to have that thing that we saw the last part. And if you go back and take the Sun as your point of view, then it appears to just orbit in a big circle like the Earth. Well, doesn't Webb do that as well? No, Webb is out. Webb is out at a different gravitational point where it orbits at the same speed the Earth does. But I've I've heard it has a corkscrew effect. That's within that tiny area. It's yeah, it's just a small. Okay. And John John says these things are called Trojan asteroids. That Jupiter has a million of them. Or... Well, we better find out what's in that horse. Open it up. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. They, they, uh, uh, 
this this was an impact with the moon. So it was after the the supposed impact that created the moon. Yeah. And how big is it? Like a kilometer or something? Ooh, across that's that's that could do some damage. Are you seeing this? Yeah. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's not in the exact plane. No. It's, a it's very close. And Ron, yeah. that 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 sort of wider oval that you see is ahead of us and behind us, not really so much above us and below us, but right. a little bit. That's what this is. The big yellow loop is for what you see if you're outside the solar system. The little yellow loop is what you see from the Earth. It looks like it's going around us. Huh. But since it looks about the same size, is, does it beat us? And is, are we following it always? Or is it oh, ever? Sometimes it's behind and sometimes it's ahead. That's what right. this is showing. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you, you guys can't see it on a regular. Oh, okay. Basis. Okay. It's only 100 meters. Oh, okay. Taller than I thought. <laughs> JPL, NASA, CIT. I love it. Fascinating stuff, Mr. Prez. Mm -hmm. We covered a lot of it, didn't we? Or did we get it all? We Not got yet. It all before Vesta, Saturn, Andromeda close up. We still got DART. Oh, the DART follow up. There we go. You can see this. Is this yep. the one we crashed into? Yeah. Yes. This is just before. This is. What Dark sent back just before. This is Dimorphos. That's, that's seen by Dark. That's the little moon of another bigger asteroid. Of Didymos, yes. Yeah. They used to call it Diddy Moon before they gave it a name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looks like a seeded sourdough to me. <laughs> Probably offended some rapper somewhere. Looks like an almond roca. Yeah. <laughs> this is um, Dark approaching. Uh, did a did dimorphous the big one yeah no the Mother, small one this is no this is yeah small yeah. one and this is an artist rendition mm -hmm. the previous one is an actual photo oh and yeah, it looks artist. just like a wad of you know loose snowball of gran granules it's a dog poop rolled in gravel yeah <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> now this is a close-up of the surface of the <laughs> of the asteroid and the pet the three rectangles on there represent the core and the two solar panel wings on dart and that's the way it hit flat on oh. like that so they sacrificed everything including the solar panels they did but yeah. they released a cube sat to take a picture of it to fly by and it was taking pictures for about five minutes um after the uh, um it, the impact it's an italian uh, L I C I A C or S, excuse me, Lycia, L I C I A cube. And it took pictures for um, five minutes and 20 seconds afterwards. These are some of the pictures that it took showing the debris flying out of the after the collision as it sped by the collision. And where is it now? The little uh, it's up there somewhere in the asteroid belt. <laughs> it's orbiting. Okay. Yeah. Now wow. they did a lot of. Um, they wanted to understand another probe is going to look for the crater, and so they did a lot of modeling of the um, um, crater. And, and what they found, they, this they're is not going to have a crater, right? They're yeah, that's it right. Just it just reshaped thing. everything. Now yeah. these are these are stereo views. So if you can cross your eyes while you're looking at it, you can actually see a stereo picture. Yeah, it works well. Yeah. So um, this is one of the this is a freeze frame of the uh, uh, impact modeled. It used a massive supercomputer because the thing is treated as a bunch of um, um, individual particles. Wow. And that made it move just slightly enough so that it. A Cheers. lot more than they expected. Yes. <clears throat> hmm. But it wouldn't have taken it out of its orbit around the other big guy, right? No. But it changed the orbit quite a bit. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. I, I tried that crossing your eyes. That works unbelievably good. 
As long as like you're those, big you remember frosting. those hallusions twenty years ago? We they were called hallusions, where you'd see some sort of a puzzle like thing. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of like those. They that came and went as a fad, didn't it? Mm -hmm. They gave yeah. me a headache. <laughs> and then I used grandma to send those out to people on a postcard with the different ones mm -hmm. because I was the food dude at one time. So I'd send people thank yous with those things on the front. And then somebody said, don't send those anymore, man. I got a headache. <laughs> <laughs> Some people never could do them. Took me a long time. Yeah. Well, fascinating. Ah, there we go. Live. Ooh. So this would be what? Stereoscopically? If we yeah, could... these are stereo images. If you want to watch it with your eyes crossed. Wow. It's like grandma and grandpa's old panoramic pictures, you know, the doubles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you actually cross your eyes, it gives a negative perspective. You actually sh should separate your eyes so you're wall-eyed to get a true visual <laughs> perspective. Or, yeah, so. You don't have to keep them crossed either. I found that out. You can just like <laughs> yeah. laugh and then you, see, then you see it. But boy. It, it's, it's a little a, like parallax, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot of parallax stuff shown in there. Okay, but parallax does it only works up to a certain distance, I think, right? Yep. For stars. Fascinating yes. stuff, Mr. Prez. What a great oh, wait a minute. We're not through. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so that moon was so loosely bound that they think it just yeah. re reformed itself into like another <laughs> ovoid shape. Yeah. Now this is from the Lyca cube, like Lycia cube. At 178 seconds, there's the main body and there's the moon that got whacked. And this is a close-up of the shadow on the debris field. This is dimorphous in here. And this is their modeling of that event. So they're comparing the states. What's that? Not bad at all. No, it's not bad at all. <laughs> so the consensus is no crater. The whole pile just absorbed it and redistributed, hmm. which has great implications for trying to move these suckers to the side if you want to. They're just going to, they will move. Yeah. But it's not going to move as a hard body. Hmm. Well, now the, the reason for this is in case we see an asteroid coming toward Earth that's big enough to wipe us out, we need a way to re deflect it, right? Mm hmm. And supposedly, I heard there was three ways you could do it. You could set off a nuke, but then you get a jillion little, you know, smaller ones that would all do damage. Uh, or you could park something big beside it, and that would alter its trajectory a little bit, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Gravitational tug. Yeah, this is the third one, that, which I guess is going to work. Or they... you could splash white paint on it if it's far enough away, and that would be enough that the uh, recoil of light reflecting off of it will push it a little bit out of its orbit. You're I think that, that may require it to be a solid. I'm not yes. sure that if you paint one side <laughs> of this thing white, it would just redistribute the, the, the boulders. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah and you want to do that. You want to do that really far away too. <laughs> yes. Well, so you know, the thing up and if, if the pieces are small <laughs> enough, don't they just burn up in our atmosphere? They never reach the surface? Right. They still deposit a lot of thermal energy, but... Um... Well, this one that we crashed into, would it, if it hit the Earth, would it have been big enough to wipe us out like the dinosaurs, or was it a small sucker? It's smaller light? than that, but it would have still been nasty. Yeah. Wow. Now, some of these, for example, if you were a fan of Star Wars and you remember the moon of Endor, with had all those um, uh, chipmunk things in it, big chipmunks. <laughs> Ewoks. Ewoks. That's it, Ewoks. And they had the Death Star up in the sky. You could see it and you could resolve it. It wasn't a point of light. It was an object like the moon about that high. And it was 500 miles in diameter. And they blew it up. And it turns out that someone did the calculations from NASA. And if there was a 500 mile diameter Death Star, made out of aluminum, for example, and it was blown up like that, then when the those pieces of, of it entered the, entered the atmosphere of Endor, it would have created so much heat that it would have destroyed life on Endor. 
<laughs> Isn't there a dwarf planet out there that it looks exactly like the Death Star? That has no, a it's a, a moon of Saturn, I think. Is that what it is? Mimas, yeah. It looks like it's got that big round, not sure what it is in Star crater. Wars, but it's a crater in real life. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, I hope uh, everybody knows 4.30 uh, on Saturday afternoon we'll have our meeting followed by... 4.30? 4.30 for the planning meeting, yes. Yeah, okay. 4.30, and I assume that any, anybody in the club can tune in and be with us. They'll all be sent a link by Andy Allen, our secretary, and I hope he knows he'll say 4.30 instead of 5. And then we'll have, hopefully, a clear night Saturday. And we've all, we've launched yeah. the fourth year, and we're all alive and happy and hopefully healthy, and you did good. I, I learned a lot. I just wish I could retain it. Well, see, happy, I want to say fourth, thanks, John. Yeah, for happy fourth year, everybody, and thanks for doing it. This is the Astro Hour signing out.